we pick up with the proclamation of 1763. On October 7th of 1763, this is right after the Seven Years' War has ended, the British government issued the proclamation of 1763. This proclamation was many-sided, but mainly it was creating three new colonies, Quebec, and right here we have Quebec, the British created Quebec, East Florida, and West Florida, right there's the dividing line. Now East and West Florida didn't so much anger the colonists as Quebec did. After the French and Indian War was over, many people in New England felt that this was territory earmarked for the spread of the Puritan, the Protestant, the English into this new territory. They could expand the size of their colonies even greater. And suddenly, bam, the king says, no, Massachusetts isn't getting any bigger. Vermont's not getting any bigger. None of you are getting any bigger. Instead, we are creating a whole new colony of Quebec. And I do believe at the time that the French Quebec region had a large um, Catholic contingent as well. And so suddenly, land earmarked for the spread of Protestantism is no longer at easy avail. In addition, after the war, many land-hungry American colonials had burst over the Appalachian Mountains and flooded into the grassy western lands on the other side. And so suddenly, all of these areas, people were running out into the in, um, Ohio River Valley to get new, fresh land. A tiny rivulet of men such as Daniel Boone had already trickled into Tennessee and Kentucky. Then out of the clear blue sky, the London government, bam, issues the proclamation of 73. This uh, 1763, sorry, this is the second part of it. It flatly prohibited, come on, there you go. It flatly prohibited settlement in the area beyond the Appalachian Mountains, pending further adjustment. It also placed the West under military command, and no new settlers were to cross across the Appalachian Mountains till further notice. Settlers who had already crossed were to move back to the East until further notice. So suddenly, down the ridge of the Appalachian Mountains, this proclamation line runs. You cannot go into the Ohio River Valley. If you did, you gotta go back. <gasps> the Indians were in revolt, and England said, we are doing this because we need time to work out Pontiac's rebellion in the Ohio Territory. Our job as mother country is to provide defense. Let us solve the Indian problem. If you go out there, you're most likely going to get massacred. So let us solve the problem. Then, once we've solved it, you can move back into this territory. But the colonists created considerable opposition to this, especially amongst land speculators. England wanted to deal fairly with the fur traders as well and all other interests. But the colonists did not see this as a protective action by England, but as a restrictive action. Was not this new land our birthright? Had not many bought it with their blood in the recent Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War? In complete defiance, 
defiance of the paper proclamation, the colonists continue to clog the westward trails. So the king says, go back till I work out the situation. Do the colonists do that and say, thank you, England, for solving and pacifying the Indian problem before we come out here and get massacred? No, we continue westward and say, how dare you? Didn't we shed blood in this recent war? Well, I didn't cover this all with you because I've rather skipped over the French and Indian War. But many of the colonists, when England said, hey, we need men, we need supplies to help this war for your own defense, we would not provide food and provisions. We would not provide men for the defense. Not until England said, fine, we will pay you to serve. We will pay you for supplies. Was there any type of enthusiasm whatsoever in the colonies? And now we're screaming, hey, our blood was shed for the acquisition of this new territory. Ay, ay, no, we had to be paid to help defend ourselves. And now, are we loyal British subjects with the rights and privileges of Englishmen? No, we are clogging the roads westward to get into this new territory in defiance of the law. Go back. And the Sugar Act of 1764. Uh-oh, what has happened? Nope, we don't want that. Okay. The Sugar Act brought about a significant change in British policy. Before the purpose of parliamentary taxation had been to control trade, not so much to raise money. Now Parliament approaches the law with the primary purpose of raising money. This actually lowered the cost of imported molasses, but the Molasses Act had not been enforced. Now we are going to enforce this law, and it's at an, because it's an old law, it's at a lower rate. But these taxes were going to pay for the soldiers that were being kept in the West and the customs officials who would bring violators to trial before British officials who were less likely to acquit violators. So here you have, dang, this does not look like it's going clear to the edge. Can I get it there? Ah, uh, now we cut off the top. Oh, well, I got the bottom filled in. Um, previously, if someone was caught violating the Molasses Act, they would be tried before a colonial assembly, colonial courts, and they would have been their friends and neighbors and fellow businessmen, and George would have said, hey, Hank, I told you you were going to get caught one of these times. Ha, huh, we got you. And he'd, everyone had a good laugh. He'd get slapped on the hand to pay a little fine, and that'd be the end of it. No, 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 no. Now the officials would be brought to trial before British officials, not fellow colonial, and they were much less likely to acquit the violators. So here in this little coffin, we have the Sugar Act, and it's marching to the sepulcher, the grave, where it is going to be buried, and all these mourners, and, you know, oh boy, he's crying up a big tune. And the guy who's reading what's going on with this Sugar Act is in front, and they are all taking this um, to its burial. The funniest part of this political cartoon, if you ask me, is, you see this little dog over here <laughs> lifting his leg? <laughs> oh, I think that's the funniest part. But anyway, the fires will keep be kept burning with the Currency Act of 1764. This act dealt with colonial money. It prohibited the colonies from issuing 
any mo more money, and the money already in use was to be gradually phased out. The colonies were to use instead only gold and silver for all their trade. This was very to be very strictly enforced by the governors, and this created great opposition in the colonies because paper money caused inflation. Look at some of this stuff. Three pence. This bill shall pass current for three pence within the province of Pennsylvania, according to an act of Congress, 1764. That was the year of the Currency Act. 40 shillings. The possessor of this bill shall be paid by the treasury of the colony of Connecticut. 40 shillings, da 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 da, da and signatures of the people. Uh, the bank or whatever that created this currency for the um, colony of Connecticut. Ten shillings. This indented pass shall, bill, I'm sorry, indented bill shall pass, um, can't quite figure out that one, for 10 shillings. And this one is uh, Delaware. Ah, from Newcastle, Kent, and Suffolk, the three uh, province, provinces um, of Delaware. Here, this one. This from state of Georgia colony of Georgia. Now, this is at the time of the Revolutionary War. This certificate entitles the bearer to one Spanish mill dollar. And England says, uh, 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 this hurts our merchants because colonials had bought a lot of manufactured goods and hadn't paid for it. Well, we were waiting for this quote unquote funny money to lose more value. <clears throat> This is not aimed at England, but at the England English merchants. If you are in Delaware, this bill holds greater value. But till you take this bill and haul it all the way over to England and some bank in England gets a hold of this, you expect me to give full face value of this? I don't know this organization. You know, is there any proof that they can back their value of this being worth what it says? And so merchants were getting pennies on the dollar for this funny money. It had great inflationary value. And now England says, no, the merchants should not be held accountable for your funny money. You will pay in gold and silver, the hard stuff that holds its value. This, of course, causes difficulty for the colonists who were wanting to pay back in the inflationary bills. And also, we had a trade imbalance going on. We were importing more than we were exporting as far as dollar value, pound value. And so there was more money leaving the colonies than were coming into the colonies. Well, that's the way the mercantilistic system is supposed to work. A trade imbalance in favor of the mother kingdom is a good thing. Well, it is getting harder and harder to get a hold of the cold, hard cash, the gold and silver, and so its value is going up, and so now we're having to pay in real money, not in funny money. The colonists, meanwhile, had begun a conspiracy theory as far back as 40 years earlier in the 1720s. They now bring it up to date in the 1760s. They say that England has lost their liberties, and they are now trying to take away the colonists' liberties. So England is under the control too much of Parliament and the king, and all, yet we are much freer over here, and so they want to limit our liberties. There was no deliberate conspiracy, but now the colonists began to perceive a conspiracy and would see a sinister hand of England in everything that would be done. 
you sniffing that conspiracy? Well, the colonists began to update that conspiracy and everything that happens, bam fits into that conspiracy, just goes to prove that we were correct, that England has it out for us. The British actually had a converse conspiracy theory about the colonists. Sometimes how one perceives reality is more important than reality itself. You're saying that's not logical. Let me say that again. Sometimes how one perceives reality is more important than reality itself. You may have it in your mind that your boss is out to put you down and try and keep you from rising and does not like you. That may not be the case of your boss at all. But everything that your boss does, you're going to perceive through that viewpoint. And if he does something negative, I knew it. If he does something positive, well, he's just trying to put me off. So it's not so apparent that he's after me. Your perception is more important than reality. And now they will see this hand of the English in everything that will happen. And keeping the fires burning we move into the Stamp Act of 1765. To raise revenue to support the new military forces, the Stamp Act required the use of stamped paper or the affixing of stamps, certifying payment of tax. Involved were about 50 trade items and certain types of commercial and legal documents, including playing cards, pamphlets, newspapers, diplomas, bills of lading, marriage licenses, wills, deeds of property. Here you have some of those stamps. So you've got something that pushes on both sides of the paper and leaves an indention into the paper. I'm sure you have at some stage or another received something that had a official stamp on it pressed into the paper. Your high school diploma probably has your high school stamp pressed into it. Many legal documents you'll find this way. So marriage license. Well, <laughs> that'll be one pound and give me two shillings for the stamp. I'd like to deck of cards. We're all going to go over to the tavern and play cards. Oh, that'll be two shillings and a pence for the tax. Everything included a tax. And some of them, as I said, were stamped into the paper. Others were like a sticker. You bought the newspaper and that'll be a pence and give me a penny for the tax. And so they take out this stamp and lick it and stick it on your newspaper. The whole time you're reading that newspaper, what are you seeing staring you in the face? That stamp. I had to pay extra to pay that tax. Parliament regarded all of these measures as reasonable and just. They were simply asking the colonists to pay their fair share for colonial defense. But the stamp tax was a direct tax, offensively obvious to the customer and clearly aimed at raising revenue. There was no way to get around it. England was trying to raise money because of the expense from the Seven Years' War, and the colonists were fully aware of it. A royal stamp, the motto in French is translated, shame to him who evil thinks. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but... And here, two parodies of the fatal stamp, an emblem of the effects of the stamp, of the fatal stamp. So the colonists said, no, this is really what the stamp looks like. It's skull and crossbones. It's poison. It's going to kill us. 
Once again, this is the place to affix the stamp. And this was printed at the bottom right-hand corner of the October 24, 1765 Pennsylvania Journal and Weekly Advertiser. So I said newspapers had to have this tax placed upon them, this stamp, and they said, look at... <laughs> Here's the stamp on your newspaper. You want the stamp? We will give you the stamp. Angry th throats raised the cry, the ancient cry of no taxation without representation. The tax managed to alienate the most articulate and highly educated segment of the American population, the newspapermen, the journalists, the lawyers, the educators. You could not get a degree without that stamp. You could, all of the people involved in business, bills of ladings had to have that stamp. Newspapers, we get our news very differently than they did back then. The newspaper was disseminated, this was long before radio, long before TV, by newspapers. And the farther you went into the interior, it may be three weeks after the newspaper was issued that it finally reached your neck of the woods. But people got their information from the newspaper. So if you suddenly place a tax on newspapers, are the editors and the people publishing articles in the newspaper going to go, oh, rah, rah, we should really support our mother country and be good colonists? No, they're going to obviously generate noisy opposition to them. Now, had they annoyed, annoyed poultry farmers, probably no one would have thought anything of it. But you annoy the highly educated and influential element of society, and you are going to hear reactions. Another example of demonstrations against the Stamp Act. And wherever there is a dot, a demonstration took place there. As you will notice by looking up the map from Maine to Georgia, Maine is not a state, or I, I'm sorry, a colony. They are a possession of Massachusetts. The demonstrations take place, obviously, along the coastal line where you have your bigger cities. You get out into the countryside and it's going to be hard to gather a group of even 40 people maybe, to have a demonstration. But where your people congregated will be much easier. And if you will notice, a predominant number of the protests are taking place more so in the North. This will continue up to the time of the Revolutionary War. The New England, the Northern states, will be agitated against England much more heavily than will the southern states. And a procession in New York in opposition to the Stamp Act. And here, yes, they have got the Stamp Act and um, skull and crossbones. The folly of England, the ruin of America. Here, they have taken the stamp collector, the British official, and run him up on a pole, and they are walking him through the town. And they are stoning him in effigy. In effigy means you make a dummy, you make a representation of the person. You've heard burning an effigy. Um, you then burn that personage, that dummy that you made, with the idea, this is what I wish I could do to that person. And here they are stoning the stamp collector or the person who sells the stamps um, in effigy. Now, based upon this artwork done, this has got to be the stupidest mob in U.S. history. They are throwing their stones at 
the caricature here of the stamp master. But look at that picture. What goes up must come down. <laughs> <laughs> so here all these rocks that they're throwing are falling on the heads <laughs> of all the protesters around them. And here you have people, colonists in opposition, taking the stamped documents and the stamps and throwing them into a big fire. You cannot charge us for these because we're going to burn them up. Parliament, when we screamed the old ancient cry, no taxation without representation, had an answer for us. And this was the theory of virtual representation. No, you do not have people from the colony of Massachusetts in Parliament. There are not people from the colony of Virginia in Parliament, the same as there are no people from the colony of India in Parliament or from South Africa or from Burma or the Philippines or wherever else. No. Instead, every member in Parliament is thinking of the good of the empire. And even though no Massachusettsian is in Parliament, we are thinking of Massachusetts' best interest because when Massachusetts does well, the whole empire does well. Parliament represents every subject in the British Empire. Worse yet, the legislation seemed to menace the basic rights of the colonists as Englishmen. Oh, we're doing all this fussing, yet we are still saying we are Englishmen with the rights and privileges of Englishmen. Both the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act provided for trying offenders in the hated admiralty courts, where juries were not allowed. In an admiralty court, you have a decision made by a judge, and that is that. There is no jury of your peers. And one of the big difference between a military court from a civilian court is that in England, they had come up with this concept of jury of your peers, and the philosophy of innocent until proven guilty. When you went to court, you were innocent, and the opposing side has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty. In an admiralty court, you are guilty. You go in. You are guilty or we wouldn't have brought you here. You must now prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are innocent. And you're going, oh, that's just the same thing said backwards. Yes, it is. But it is ever so much more work to prove your innocence than to be able to say I'm innocent and just keep enough evidence there in your favor than the other side can prove which would cause you to be guilty. <sighs> Trial by jury and innocent until proven guilty were ancient privileges that um, Englishmen everywhere held dear. And besides that, they're trying us in military court. Why was the British Army needed here in the colonies at all? We're collecting all these taxes to pay for these redcoats. Now that the French were vanquished and Pontiac's rebellion had been crushed, what do we need all these military guys walking down our streets? <sighs> you sniffing that um, conspiracy theory? We know why they're still here. Could the real purpose be to whip the rebellious colonials themselves into line? Many Americans, once again, pick up the conspiracy theory. We scream, no taxation without representation. Is that what we really wanted? No, we didn't want that. Well, then why are we screaming, 
no taxation without representation. Had we have been given representation, you have to realize there are thousands in British Parliament in the House of Commons. And so they could have said, all right, we got 32 New World colonies. We'll give you 32 representatives in Parliament. Can you say you didn't get your representation? No. So then the next time an issue, who's going to pay the taxes for this? And Parliament says, oh, no, let's make the colonials pay for it because most of it's going to benefit them, not the mother country. And you thir 32 delegates all with one voice say, no, we don't want to vote that issue that would create higher taxes for us. But 1,200 people vote, oh, no, let's make the colonials pay for this. You're going to get outvoted every last time. But can you blame England and say no taxation without representation? No, you got your representation. You had your say. So we didn't really want actual representation. What we wanted was a return to the good old days when the navigation laws had only very laxly been enforced and the Americans had suffered no taxation. Basically, when we did what we pleased, when we were in essence self-governing, that's what we really wanted a return to. And the Quartering Act in the very same year Resentment was kept burning with this quartering act, which required the colonies to feed and house British troops. There was not forts all over, military barracks all over the colonies to house these soldiers, and there were very few Motel 6s. And so with all this incoming of new military personnel, where are we going to house them? This applied to all colonies, but affected mainly New York City, the headquarters of the British forces. The new act raised troubling questions in the colonies. Why was it necessary for British soldiers to be stationed in colonial cities in peacetime? Was not the Quartering Act another example of taxation without representation? As the colonies had neither requested the troops nor had been asked their opinion in the matter. Some colonists decided that the Quartering Act was, in, was an effort to use British soldiers to tyrannize the Americans. The New York Colonial Assembly defied the Quartering Act and refused to provide beds or supplies for British troops. Huh? Just what'll you do about that? I mean, <laughs> we are not being loyal British subjects. We are demanding the rights and privileges of Englishmen while doing as we please and the sons of liberty, sons and daughters of liberty. Come on, I clicked on you. Ah, there we go. The sons of liberty sprung up as a patriotic terrorist group in opposition to the Stamp Act. They succeeded in directing violence against the Stamp Act. And violence in several American cities. In some cases, the riots got out of hand and resulted in injury to people and property that was sympathetic to the king. One example is Chief Justice Thomas Hutchison. One of the most destructive riots was in August 26, 17. 65 in Boston. It led to the looting of the home of the Chief Justice. This was channeled in the wrong direction against this man. He is being a loyal British subject. He is sent over to be the Chief Justice. And what do the colonists do? 
because he is supporting British law, which is his job, they trash and burn his house. Ugh. Poor guy. I think I already showed you this one. The Sons of and Daughters of Liberty meeting in New York. Other acts of violence was perpetrated upon subjects who upheld the British law. Here, we will go on to talk about having liberty trees. Here, the Stamp Act, we have it stuck on the tree upside down. And because this man has insisted on selling the stamps and enforcing the British laws, we have decided to tar and feather him. Ha, 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 ha. No, this is no ha, 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 ha. This is probably a death sentence. People don't realize how horrible tar and feathering was. First of all, the largest organ on the body is your skin. No other organ is bigger than your skin. And if you talk to the medical profession, I probably should have looked this up, but when a burn victim arrives at the hospital, if the burns cover X percentage of the body, there's usually no coming back from that. They give you morphine and stuff to make you comfortable until within a day or two you pass away. It's just too much damage. If you have under X amount, I don't know if it's somewhere between 60 and 70% burn, you've got 30% decent skin, um, that may be the point where there's a possibility of coming back from this. Now, is the comeback going to be rah-ha-ha? -ha? No, it is going to be excruciating months of being in the hospital. Um, skin grafts from what little skin you have left, uh, just horrendous. Now, you take someone and you're going to tar and feather them. Tar hat is a somewhat solid mass, and you need to make it um, ameliable, and you do so by heating it up. You heat it up enough, it becomes very liquidy, and you can spread it and do what you want with it. So till you heated that tar up so you could spread it all over a person's body, it is thick and it retains that heat the whole time it is spread on your skin until 20-30 minutes later when it's finally cooled down that tar has baked your skin killed your skin and then of course they roll you in um, feathers and make you look ridiculous well can you imagine the process of getting that tar off as you're pulling the tar off you're just pulling the whole top layer of the person's skin Skin off and uh, don't even want to think about it. So, yes, tar and feathering was not something any person would ever want to endure. And here, loyal British subjects, we are tarring and feathering them for doing their job. The Stamp Act was never enforced. And in the fall of 1765, New England merchants began boycotts or non-importation agreements on English goods. American consumption of British goods fell so much so that the British shippers appealed to Parliament to repeal the Stamp Act. Now, is that an appropriate action? Absolutely. So if you don't want to pay the tax, you don't have to buy the goods. No problem in that. The United States has used um, non-purchasing as a method to coerce people for years. More up to date, but still probably before your time. Um, the workers in the fields out on the west coast, California in particular. The um, growers, when it was harvest time, would bring in 
individuals to help bring the crops in, usually Mexican migrant farm workers. And Cesar Chavez, it's Cesar or Cesar, I think it's Cesar Chavez, he for years was fighting for migratory workers' rights. He says they come from one area to the next up the coast of California, and they're being treated horribly. Um, poor wages, poor living conditions, and they're doing all this backbreaking work. And so one of his big things were he told Americans to boycott the buying of table grapes. California is big for its grape industry. Now, he's not going after the wine owners, uh, you know, who are doing um, making of wine out of it, but grapes are sold across the country. You go to your local grocery store and you can buy grapes, white grapes, purple grapes, you know, all different kinds of grapes, seedless grapes, Concord grapes. And he said to Americans, these farm owners, I have for years been petitioning them to treat the workers better. I want you to send a message to them by refusing to buy table grapes. And so stores were bringing in all these grapes to sell and no one would buy them and they'd rot on the floors and then have to be thrown out. Well, year after year, you send this message to the farmers, we're not going to buy your grapes, we're going to um, boycott, and the farmers have the choice. Am I going to stay in business or not? If I want to stay in business, I've got to treat my workers better so I get the stamp of approval. So yes, there is no problem with non-importation. If you don't want to buy it, don't buy it. But this handbill has gone a little bit towards the other side. William Jackson, an importer at the Brazen Head, north side of the townhouse and opposite the town pump in Cornbill, Boston. It is desired that the sons and daughters of liberty, liberty would not buy any one thing of him, for in so doing they will bring disgrace upon themselves and their posterity forever and ever. Amen. Bam. If you buy from this guy, he has imported, and you are not supporting the boycott because he is not supporting the boycott. He's buying English goods and putting them on his shelf. To point out a single store owner and tell all the sons and daughters of Liberty don't buy from him, that's a little maybe a bit nasty, but it is still fair game. He has imported and they are just pointing it out. William Pitt. He is in the House of Commons. This is part of Parliament, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. He is in the House of Commons, and he was for the American colonials. He applauded their boycott. Good for you. You didn't like it. You took action. Fair game. The merchants, the English merchants actually petitioned Parliament to, to repeal the act in order for them to get more business. He was for less parliamentary influence over colonial matters. Even the king seemed willing to repeal the Stamp Act. The conclusion was the Stamp Act was repealed. But the Declaratory Act of 1766 was passed, and it said that Parliament had full authority over the colonies. This is one of those safe phasing, face face saving measures. Yes, we lost. We have to, de to um, repeal the Stamp Act, but bam, we put the declaratory acts through, which says, hey, we didn't have to repeal that. We are still in charge. We have the right to rule and raise taxes over the colonists. Yes, uh, <laughs> we didn't lose by repealing the Stamp Act an act for the better securing 
the dependency of his majesty's domains in America upon the crown and parliament of Great Britain. Yes, how can we make you still be dependent on us? Yes, we are still in charge. And Charles Townsend. Charles Townsend persuaded Parliament in 1767 to pass the Townsend Acts. The most important of these new regulations was a light import duty on glass, white lead, paper, and tea. Unlike the Stamp Act, this was an indirect tax paid at the ports, but the colonists were flush with victory and were in a rebellious mood. Direct tax, indirect tax, I, I thought all taxes were taxes. Yes, a direct tax means you have that stamp that was affixed to your diploma, was affixed to your marriage license, it's affixed to your newspaper, and it stares you in the face all day long and riles you up. An indirect tax means we taxed it as it came off the ship into Boston Harbor, into New York Harbor, into whatever harbor, and the merchant who took possession of that item paid the tax. The merchant now amortizes that. I got seven chests of tea. I now bag it into little um, paper bags and sell it in smaller quantities. I had to pay extra couple of pounds on each chest for that. So I'm going to pass that cost along to the colonist. So instead of paying a pound for your tea in the bag and then an extra pence for the tax, instead it's incorporated. And when you go up to the register to pay for your tea, the cashier says that'll be a pound and a pence, not a pound for the tea and a pence for the stamp I'm going to stick on it. So it's not glaringly obvious in your face. You're still paying it, but indirectly. The new Townsend revenues, worse yet, would be used to pay the salaries of the royal governors and the judges in America. <sighs> White lead, paper, not such a big idea, but that tea tax, ooh, the British must have their tea. Um, yes, coffee was becoming in vogue and whatnot, but still, I mean, these are people who have been hundreds of years drinking their tea. And this is a cutout here from here, a little bit enlarged, telling them all about the tax on tea. And this placard, oh, I love this placard. Nothing was thought of but this taxation. And the easiest method of liquidation was enough to vex the souls of the men of Boston Town to read this under the seal of the crown. They were loyal subjects of George III, so they believed and so they averred. But this bristling, offensive placard set on the walls was worse than a bayonet. Ew. <sighs> we're a loyal subject of George the Third. Oh, we, maybe we were loyal, but boy, were we complaining. Yes, um, that tea tax. The true sons of liberty and supporters of the non-importation agreements. Yeah, non-importation agreements were revived again. The colonists overall took the new tax less seriously as they could secure smuggled tea at a cheap price and consequently smugglers increased their activities, especially in Massachusetts. <sighs> Loyal British subjects. Here we made, uh, in Boston, they made merchants sign protest pledges against importing English goods. Here, true sons and daughters of liberties and supporters of the non-importation agreement are determined to resent any, the least insult or menace 
offered to any one or more of the several committees appointed by the body at Faneuil Hall. That's downtown Boston where the colonists would meet. And chastise any one or more of them as they deserve and will also support the, the printers in anything the committees shall desire them to print. As a warning to anyone that shall affront as aforesaid upon sure information given, one of these advertisements will be will be posted up at the door or dwelling house of the offender. So we are going to make you abide by the non-importation agreements. And if anyone should take down our posters, we will come and stick the poster on the door of your very house. Don't mess with us. Here they published the names of those who continued to import British goods and who would not practice non-importation. So here, let's list in the newspaper your names. This is a blacklist printed in the North American Almanac. This goes throughout the whole colonies. For 1770, identifying the Boston merchants who had ignored the non-importation agreements. Ooh, nasty. And, all right, we're not going to import British tea, so are we going to do without? No, we're going to secure smuggled in Dutch tea. We're going to break the law. British officials landed two regiments of troops in Boston in 1768. Liberty-loving liberty -loving colonials resented the presence of these redcoats. We taunted them unmercifully. Now, did England have good reason for sending them to Boston? Yeah, Boston was going in your face to England. And here now, England says we must contain this and have law and order. And they send two more regiments over to Boston. Ooh, smell that conspiracy theory. They are out to get us. Is peace going to continue? Absolutely not. We are mad at these redcoats and a clash will ensue. And this is known as the Boston Massacre. And we will come to that next.